In today's video, we're going to be ranking the top 25 players in the NBA solely based off the 2024 NBA season. So this has nothing to do with the career accolades of these players. This is solely about what they did in the 2024 season. This is pretty unusual for how I do my rankings. I usually go based off if I'm trying to win a title next year, who do I want the most on my team? That's usually how we rank the lists, whether it's football or basketball. Not today. Like again, like I said, I want to stress this is solely based off of the past season. Uh, today we're going to be doing part one, which will be 25 through 11. And then tomorrow, or maybe the next day after that, we'll be doing my top 10. So let's get into the list right now. Really quick, I did want to mention, I'm also not factoring in games missed in this list. I know a lot of people probably do take that into consideration, but I, I just think it's far too difficult if you factor in games played like, oh, this guy played 50. Well, this guy played 60. Like, how do you really factor that? I think it's too difficult. So I just went with when they were on the court. I'm ranking that. I'm not really looking too far into games played. Starting off the list at 25, we have Damian Lillard, a guy who drastically fell from where I had just last season, his final year in Portland. I still had him as a borderline top 10 player in basketball, a borderline superstar level guy. However, this year, the fit with Giannis was just very strange. The Bucks overall had a very strange season. They got off to, you know, it's, it looked like the fit was kind of weird between him and Giannis. However, they were winning games. They were 30 and 13. Then they made the decision to fire their head coach, Adrian Griffin. Still kind of a, a head scratcher at this point in time because when Doc Rivers got in there, uh, the team, I think, looked drastically worse. I think they went 500 over Doc Rivers' tenure. And then, of course, the playoffs were an unmitigated disaster with Giannis not playing a single second in the playoffs and Dame eventually getting hurt. So let's take a look at Dame's numbers for this season. They're definitely all kind of down from last season, obviously, with a, a lower usage being on the Bucks. Uh, he played 73 games. Averaged 24 points per game, 4 rebounds per game, 7 assists per game. He shot 42 from the field and 35 from behind the arc with a steal per game. So still really good numbers. Still an all-star level guard. Still a guy I consider to have a big bounce back year next year. But when you combine the fact that his stats did drop so drastically compared to whenever he was the guy, that that kind of that calls into question, for me at least, the fit with Giannis directly. And number two... Just how bizarre of a season the Bucks had as a whole. Those kind of, um, it, it's weird with Dame. So this might be too low on him, but I'm expecting him to bounce back next season. At 24, we have Paolo Bancaro, who made the all-star team just in his second year in the NBA, which I think is a clear indication that this guy is a star. And he also led the Orlando Magic to the five seed and took the Cleveland Cavaliers to seven games in his first playoff appearance. He was really good in the playoffs, and we talked about this all throughout his rookie year. I'm going to keep on saying it is the poise with which this kid plays with is honestly concerning. The fact that he's so good at such a young age, he's comfortable with being the lead ball handler, he's comfortable with being the lead scorer at such a young age, and now... Just in his second year, like we said, all-star and already leading the Magic to a playoff berth. So let's take a look at his counting stats from this year. He played 80 games this year, uh, 23 points per game, 7 rebounds per game, 5 assists per game. He shot 46% from the field and 34 behind the line. He had a steal per game and a block basically every other game. So a great second year for Paolo, and he's just going to get better as time goes on. I could easily see him becoming a top 10-ish guy in the next two, three seasons. At 23, we have Jimmy Butler, similarly to Damian Lillard, another vet who drastically dropped down the list. I think I had Jimmy at 8 last season. Uh, and a big reason why, the main reason why Jimmy dropped so much is because where Jimmy Butler shows his value is the playoffs. And he was not able to do that this year. We all know that he's a good regular season player. He's like a, a borderline all-star level guy in the regular season. But we all know Jimmy saves his energy. He saves all that for the postseason. So not being able to see postseason Jimmy, I feel like really knocked his value down this year. Obviously, he didn't play a second of the playoffs. He played in that play-in game against Philly where he got hurt. And then the Heat went on to make the playoffs. But obviously, like we said, he didn't play. So yeah, Jimmy... He is one of my favorites. I wanted to put him higher, but he wasn't able to showcase that postseason value he brings. So solely looking at his regular season numbers, he played 60 games, 21 points per game, five rebounds per game, five assists per game. 
Uh, his efficiency was really good this year, though. 50% from the field and then 41 from behind the arc is really impressive for Jimmy Butler. And he also averaged a steal per game. So you could argue to maybe put him higher. But like I said, his true value is showcased in the postseason. We just didn't get any of that this year. At 22, we have Tyrese Halliburton. Now, if we were just ranking the first half of the year, Tyrese Halliburton would be significantly higher up on this list. If we're talking about before the All-Star break, he would maybe even be pushing into the top 10. That's how good he was to start off the year. Um, but he definitely did cool off post-All-Star break, especially with his scoring. Um, so factoring it all in, it puts him right here at 22. But you got to give him a lot of credit for his postseason success, leading the Indiana Pacers to a conference finals appearance. Now, we made videos all about that. They're probably the worst conference finals team, at least since I've been watching basketball for about eight years now. There has not been a worse team to make a conference finals appearance than that Pacers team. They got a lot of favors due to injuries. I'm not trying to knock them because... A lot of teams in the history of the NBA, title teams, they they get <laughs> favorable matchups due to injuries. So I'm not knocking the Pacers for that. It's just a clear reality of the situation. Let's take a look at his counting numbers, though, for the year. 69 games played, 20 points per game, 4 rebounds per game, an impressive 11 assists per game. I think he is truly one of the best passers. You could argue the best passer in basketball right now. He's on a short list of that. 48% uh, from the field, 36 from Behind the arc, he also averaged a steal and 0.7 blocks per game. So really good year from Tyrese. I just wish he would have kept up that production before the All-Star break, and he definitely would have been higher. Um, but he's one of those younger guys. He's going to keep climbing these kind of lists as the years go on. At 21, we have, ironically enough, the guy who was traded for Tyrese Halliburton. I didn't even do that on purpose. It just coincidentally happened. But Sabonis had one of the best under-the-radar seasons. One of the, I think you can argue, honestly, one of the best just all-around seasons for any player in the NBA. Let's take a look at his numbers. He played 82 games, so he played every regular season game, 19 points per game, 14 rebounds per game, 8 assists per game, an incredible efficiency from a big man, 59% from the field, 38% from behind the arc. He averaged a steal a game and .6 blocks per game, so... Just a tremendous, monstrous, well-rounded year. And people forget there was a point in time around like that January point where Sabonis actually did enter the top five ladder for MVP. That might sound crazy, but you can go look it up. That actually happened back during the season. It's crazy that between him and Fox, the Kings didn't have an all-star this year. I think that goes to show how underrated the Kings truly are. But just a great, well-rounded year from Sabonis. And at 20, we have Sabonis' teammate, De'Aaron Fox. I wanted to put them right next to each other because I think the debate between who the Kings' best player is really close. It's neck and neck. I can see the argument from either side, but I'm ultimately going to go with De'Aaron Fox. He's, I think, their most important player. He's the lead, lead ball handler, the playmaker of the team. So I'm going to go with him by a smidge over Sabonis. Let's take a look at his numbers. 74 games played, 27 points per game, 5 rebounds per game, and 6 assists per game. Uh, he shot 47% from the field, 37% from behind the arc, and he also averaged two steals a game, which is, you know, one of the best in the league at that. Um, continues to be one of the fastest players, one of the hardest to guard players in the NBA right now. And just taking a look at the Kings as a whole, you know, a lot of people looked at them like they took a massive step back this year because last year they were the three seed, and then this year they were the nine seed and missed playoffs because they lost in the play-in bracket. So... Uh, a lot of people look at them as like, hey, they took a massive step back this year. The crazy thing is, though, they only lost two more games. You know, they won 48 games in 2023. They were the three seed. This year, they won 46 games, but they were the ninth seed. That just shows you how insane the Western Conference is and how much, you know, shit can change in the West. So, um we already talked about the Kings a little bit with the DeRozan trade, but I think they're going to be a higher seed next year. But yeah, Fox and Sabonis, definitely one of the better duos in the NBA right now. At 19, we have this year's reigning finals MVP, Jalen Brown. So typically when a player wins the finals MVP, it kind of skyrockets them up the list. You know, with Giannis, after he won his finals MVP, I had him at number one. After Jokic won his finals MVP, I put him at number one. Even though a lot of people already had Jokic at one, I was kind of one of those people dragging my feet on Jokic. After he won that, I was like, there's really no realistic argument I have. But for Jalen Brown, it more so comes down to the team. 
of the Boston Celtics. And it's at the end of the day, someone had to win the finals MVP. We all know the reason they won is because that great starting lineup, I've said it before and I'll continue to say it. I think that the 2024 Boston Celtics starting five is the best starting five since the Kevin Durant Warriors. So um, definitely an impressive postseason run, a great finals performance from Jalen Brown, but it's not to the tier of like a Giannis or a Jokic who really carried those teams. Let's take a look at Jalen Brown's numbers, though. He played 70 games this year, 23 points per game, 6 rebounds per game, and 4 assists per game. He shot 50% from the field, 35% from behind the arc, and he also averaged a steal a game and half a block per game. So really good year from Jalen Brown. Um, the people out there saying that he's like the, the Celtics' best player now because he got the finals MVP, that's bullshit. I still think Tatum is a far better player, much more well-rounded um, than Brown. Um, but he's still a really, really good player, a guy who could threaten to make an all-NBA team any year, one of the most versatile players in the league. So that's why he's here. And at 18, we have Paul George. I basically just view him as a more well-rounded version of Jalen Brown. And we also found out this year that this was his final year with the LA Clippers. And we already made a video about his move to Philly. So if you want to hear my thoughts on all that, you can definitely go check that out. Um, but Paul George had one of his more healthy seasons in recent memory, playing 74 games this year. It's really good to see that from PG. He averaged 23 points per game, five rebounds per game, and four assists per game with a pretty efficient year, 47% from the field and 41 from behind the arc. He also averaged a steal and a half per game and half a block per game. So a really strong year from Paul George, and I'm really excited to see him in his new role going into Philly next year. Coming in at 17, we have Donovan Mitchell, who played 55 games this year. He averaged 27, 5, and 6 on 46% from the field, 37 from behind the arc. He also averaged two steals per game and half a block per game. So a really strong, productive year from Donovan Mitchell. Obviously, he did deal with injuries throughout the season, midway through the year, and then obviously uh, in the playoffs he got hurt. But he did lead the Cavs to their first playoff series victory since LeBron James left Cleveland. So you do like to see the Cavs taking a step in the right direction there because last year they lost in the first round of the Knicks. It was really disappointing. But this year they were able to win in the first round. They beat the Magic in seven. I thought, honestly, they were going to blow that series, but they ended up winning. Uh, and then obviously he got hurt in round two. Um, I don't think it really would have mattered if he would have played because that Boston team was just so loaded. Um, but you like to see that. You like to see progress from year to year. They made it last year, lost in the first round. They made it to the second round this year. Maybe next year they'll get to the conference final. We also learned that um, Donovan Mitchell has about as much power in this Cavaliers organization as LeBron does in the Lakers organization. At least, you know, that was a popular quote from an executive floating around out there. And it does kind of make sense because, number one, Donovan Mitchell is a stud. But number two, the Cavs are kind of, you know... They were desperate to keep Donovan because if he would have left in free agency, they would have been fucked. So they got him to stay on a three-year deal. Uh, I'm happy for the Cavs being that, you know, <laughs> they're only, a, you know, about an hour and a half drive from my house. I've been to a couple Cavs, game, Cavs games and Donovan is a blast to watch. And at 16, we have Kawhi Leonard, who just had relatively one of his most healthy seasons, at least of recent memory, playing 68 games this year. That seems like a fucking miracle, just given Kawhi's recent past with all the injuries. Um, but he's another vet on this list that has dropped over the past couple of years, like uh, we just talked about with Jimmy Butler and Damian Lillard. Um, a massive reason for that is he's definitely shifted his game much more to the offensive side of the ball. I feel like there are people out there that still think he's like an elite defender. He's nowhere near the defender he was with the Spurs or the Raptors back then when he could just completely shut down any perimeter player in the NBA. He he has spurts of that where he can like show glimpses of the past, but he is nowhere near that all-NBA level defender he once was. He's very much so shifted his game to the offensive side of the ball, and I'm not knocking him for that, you know. Uh, it's an offensive league. Players get paid for putting up big points, big numbers. So I can't really knock Kawhi Leonard for that. But I feel like if there are people out there that still think he's an elite defender, that's just kind of ludicrous. I don't think you're really watching him. Uh, let's take a look at his numbers. 24 points per game, 6 rebounds per game, and 4 assists per game. So like we said, back when he was putting up those stats, plus having world-class defense, being arguably the best defender in basketball, 
those offensive numbers paired with that defense is what made him a top five player in the world. But now you give those numbers, they're really good offensive numbers, but now you take away the versatility with the defense. It does drop him down the list here to 16. 53 from the field, 42% from behind the arc, so really efficient. Uh, still 1.6 steals, that's still really good, and a block. So that's where I have Kawhi. And at 15, we have Victor Wembanyama, who is obviously a rookie this past year. So that might lead some people to say that I'm overhyping him, putting him at 15. But uh, I think if that's your take, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about because Victor Wembanyama is already this good. Uh, number one, he's the best defensive player in basketball. Uh, I think he would have won Defensive Player of the Year if the Spurs weren't just a dumpster fire around him. I think you have to kind of be on a winning team to win that award. Um, he was hands down the best defensive player, the most impactful defensive player in basketball right now. And if you want to know more about that, look up Nerd Sesh's video on Victor Wembanyama's rookie year and how ridiculous his defensive impact was. They break all that down and show you how monstrous of a year he had and that's just his defense also his offense he can handle the ball like a guard he can do everything you want I mean and he's seven six he's seven six and can dribble the ball like a point guard handle shoot all of it I think he is he has potential to be the best player of all time will he reach that I don't know but he has the skill set to do that if he stays healthy he played 71 games 21 points per game, 11 rebounds per game, 4 assists per game, 47% from the field, 33% from behind the arc. He averaged a steal a game and a monstrous 3.6 blocks, which is in, like unheard of for a rookie. And at 14, we have Kyrie Irving coming off of one of his best years in the NBA. Now, there have been years where he's averaged more points per game, but in terms of his efficiency, that was incredible this year. And in terms of just his fit with the Dallas Mavericks, he was sensational this year and was a massive reason why they were able to reach the NBA Finals. That being said, he was drastically bad in the NBA Finals. I'm not going to gloss over that. That's definitely a big knock on Kyrie. He was fucking terrible in the Finals. Whether it was the Celtics fans booing him every time he touched the ball, I don't know. But at least for the regular season and the postseason up until the Finals, Kyrie Irving definitely had one of the best seasons of his NBA career. Let's take a look quickly at his numbers. He played 58 games. Um, he averaged 26, 5, and 5. And like I said, the efficiency, incredible. 50% from the field, a guard who basically their entire game is predicated on jump shots and tough at the rim uh, finishing to shoot 50%. I don't think people understand how insane that is for Kyrie Irving's play style. And then also elite three point percentage, 41%. He also averaged a steal a game and also half a block per game as well for a, a guard. Pretty impressive. So Kyrie, like I said, this was definitely one of the better years of his career, being a second option on a team that got to the NBA Finals. And at 13, we have Anthony Edwards. I feel like this was really the year Anthony Edwards broke out as a superstar in the NBA. We all knew he was really good. He'd been an all-star in years prior, but I feel like this was the year that Anthony Edwards really cemented himself as a superstar in this league. I go back, it was pretty early in the season, but it was a game against the Boston Celtics, obviously the best team in the NBA this year. Not only the champion, but also being such a dominant regular season team, winning 64 games. They beat that Celtics team really early in the year, and it was because of Anthony Edwards. I think he had like 40 points, was locking up Tatum on the other side of the ball and hit a massive game winner. After that game, I came on here, made a short, and I said, this kid is a superstar now. It's official, and he went on to prove that, leading the Timberwolves to the Western Conference Finals. And let's take a look at his numbers this year. He played in 79 games this year. He averaged 26, 5-5, five and five, shot 46% from the field, 36 from behind the arc, also averaged a steal a game and half a block a game. Uh, like we said, uh, just a really... It's always a blast to just watch these young players break out as studs, and that's exactly what Anthony Edwards did, and I think he's just only going to add to that. And, uh, you know, you could see, not in the near distant future, the Timberwolves may be raising a Larry O'Brien because this guy is that good. The sky is the limit for Anthony Edwards. And coming in at 12, we have Devin Booker. Kind of a quiet year for Devin Booker. You know, he's a guy we're accustomed to hearing a lot from the national coverage. You know, the Suns have been a powerhouse the past couple of years. They obviously pulled off the KD trade. They traded for Beal. So it felt like the Suns have been one of the most heavily covered teams over the past couple of years. But this year, 
didn't really hear him a lot from them, and I think that really stemmed from the fact they got off to a really bad start. They dealt with injuries. Devin Booker dealt with injuries. Kind of a weird construction of their team, which we talked about all throughout the year. And obviously, Devin Booker played the point guard for majority of this season. I still really don't like that fit whatsoever. Uh, let's take a look at his numbers. He played 68 games. He averaged 27 points per game, 5 rebounds per game, and 7 assists per game. He shot 49% from the field, 36% from 3. He also averaged a steal per game. So um, really good year from Devin Booker, but I feel like you know when you look at some of his prior seasons, um, they were a little more dominant, you know, especially from behind the arc. So I don't know. We're definitely going to have to make a video about the Suns going into next year because I just think they're one of the most bizarre situations in the NBA. But I still obviously view D-Book as one of the best in the NBA, and that's why he's here at 12. And just barely missing our top 10, at number 11, we have Jalen Brunson, ironically a guy who wears number 11, another weird coincidence in this video. Um, but holy shit, I don't think anyone saw Jalen Brunson becoming the guy he has. Obviously the Mavs didn't, or they would have paid him. Um, and I remember back when he signed with the Knicks, like I liked Jalen Brunson. He was good with the Mavs, especially in that playoff run against the Jazz. He was really good. Um, but I, I can't remember exactly what he got. I want to say like 27 mil a year. I was like, that's a lot for a guy who really is just coming off of a really successful postseason. But other than that, it was like we hadn't seen a ton of Jalen Brunson as like a lead guard. And he is now, I think, on one of the best value contracts in the NBA right now because he's clearly one of the best players in the NBA, one of the best point guards. And, you know, what he's done for revitalizing the New York Knicks franchise, I know that they made the, the playoffs with uh, Julius Randle before back in 2021. Um, but this team is so much better now with, with him at the helm. He's just so, he's really turned into just an all-around incredible floor general and all-around great leader for this Knicks team. Uh, let's take a look at his numbers. He played 77 games this year, averaged 29 points per game, four rebounds per game, seven assists per game. He shot 42% from the field and also shot 35 from behind the arc and also averaged a steal per game. So... Yeah, I mean, what a monster Jalen Brunson has turned into. But that is going to be it for today's video. That's going to be it for part one. Like I said, stay tuned for part two where we're going to be ranking the top ten. Uh, and definitely let me know down in the comments if you agree with the list, if you disagree with the list. Do you think I'm an idiot for these rankings? Definitely let me know how you would rank these players. And if you made it this far, really appreciate you, like always, listening to me ramble. Go ahead and leave a like and subscribe.